Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, a weekly podcast where we stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, helping you get the best results from your marketing efforts. Now let's join our hosts, Paul Avery and Martin Broadhurst. Welcome to episode 10 of Artificially Intelligent Marketing. We're glad to have you here where myself and my good friend Martin Broadhurst. Hi there, Martin. Hello, Paul. Ten episodes. Wow, we've done well. We stuck at it. Whoop, whoop. The audience are like, oh, God, they stuck at it. But hey, you're still here too. We love you for it. Um, We're going to be diving into this week's very cool AI news and interesting topics with all of the lowdown on what it means for marketers and what they need to know. This is a chunky one this week, isn't it, Martin? We have um, a bunch of really interesting stories and a ton of short snippets. So this week, for the bigger stories, we're going to focus on Google's I.O. conference, which was full of a ton of updates, many of them um, related to AI. And I read a few things online implying that Google had gone from massively behind the curve to suddenly in front of the curve. So maybe we can get into detail about whether that's hyperbole or if it's a fair reflection, Martin. Um, We're also going to talk a little bit about Anthropic's uh, LLM Claude, which they've expanded the capabilities of, and Martin's been playing with that, so I think it'll be interesting to go into that. We're going to talk about Meta's announcement of their new generative AI tools for advertisers. We're going to talk about Stability AI's new text animation tool, and we're going to talk about some news from Microsoft uh, about the chatbot ads are coming. So they're going to be like the sort of main stories of the week. And then in terms of the tools of the week, um, I've been lucky enough to get onto the Firefly, Adobe Firefly beta, and I've been having a little play with that, and I'll share my experiences. In terms of the short snippets, the things we're going to very briefly mention, but we won't have time to get into detail on. Take a deep breath, because there's a lot here. Um, There was this week an article in Bloomberg um, reporting that BuzzFeed readers spend 40% more time on AI-generated quizzes compared to the traditional ones that have been created by humans. I haven't been able to go into this story in depth, but it'd be really interesting to know what has driven that. So I think that's one we'll probably follow up on. I'd actually forgotten BuzzFeed was still a thing. Well, there you go. And here we are. There we are. I'm going to have to try it out. There you are. So I think that could be uh, interesting. And there's a number of ways I could imagine AI can use insights about the successes of previous quizzes to be able to optimize quizzes for humans in a way that us poor humans have to somewhat follow our experience and gut as opposed to data gleaned from a million other quizzes, which they would perhaps be able to do. Um, There was a a research report where OpenAI used GPT-4 to try and understand how GPT works. Um, If that's making your brain hurt a bit, you're not the only one. In essence, there's a lot of discussion about how large language models, especially the most new ones, the largest ones built on, you know, a trillion parameters that we don't really know how they work. We know the fundamentals, but we don't, we can't explain after the fact how they generated a particular output. And so what OpenAI tried to do is try to use GPT-4 to try and make some predictions about what a particular model would output at scale um, and got particularly close in a number of areas. So I think there was limitations in the research, but it could uh, help us to identify how the models behave, which could become important when we're thinking about things like safety um, and alignment issues, which we've talked about before. Yeah, explainability is going to be so important in this area going forward. And I think a lot of that you'll see only becoming more important with uh, the expectations of regulators. Absolutely. So you can see why they commissioned this research. Obviously, explaining how GPT-2 works compared to GPT-4 is going to be a lot easier given the size of the the training data set and how the model works and all that other stuff, but there you go. Um, Wendy's in the US is working on an AI chatbot that's being developed in collaboration with Google to service customers at its drive-throughs, which is quite interesting. I mean, we've seen a lot of automation in the fast food space over the last couple of years as it is, and here's another potential job. Um, within the fast food industry that we might see supplanted where a human no longer manages that interaction, but a chatbot does instead. Interesting. Um, We've got Midjourney 5.1 is already here and producing much higher quality images, especially when you're working with shorter prompts. And I don't know about you, mine, but I'm 
playing with lots of different image generation tools at the moment, but it's hard to look beyond mid journey in terms of just quality of output. Yeah, I was looking at a comparison of mid journey three to mid journey 5.1, same prompt and just looking at the outputs. And it's, I mean, you would have thought there was five, six, seven years worth of research difference between them and it's barely 12 months. Yeah. That's kind of insane. Um, so I think mid journey is proving at least for us, the tool of choice that we are playing with at the moment, um, because it seems to be the most capable when it comes to producing really quality polished outputs. Um, there was a leaked memo. In fact, this is after we launched the podcast about an hour after we went live last week. So it's old news now, seven days, mine old news, um, about a leaked memo from Google that where an internal employee supposedly an internal employee, we should say, questions the ability of large companies like Google and OpenAI to be able to innovate and differentiate their products faster than those working on open source alternatives um, for a huge amount of reasons, not least just innovative ideas and bandwidth and the number of people that can tinker with open source tools and, and take them forward. Um, they gave some specific examples in there, didn't they, about being able to run the open source models on smartphones already, albeit very slowly at five tokens per minute. But just talking about the level of optimization that you can get when you take an open source model and fine tune it and optimize it to these specific use cases. And the language that they used in the um, memo as well was quite interesting how they said, we do not have a moat when it comes to AI and nor does open AI. Um, however, I have thoughts which we'll come on to in the Google I.O. story. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't quite agree with that moat um, statement because I think having an installed user base using Google apps or Microsoft-based apps in like hundreds of millions is a fairly significant moat. Yeah, that moat seems quite wide. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a commercial moat there. There just may not be an innovation moat and product development moat. Um, and you know, the point you made is a really good one, Martin, in terms of open source tinkerers finding ways to train models at a vastly reduced cost and much faster than some of the models that are coming out of the bigger players um but actually without any real dropping quality in the output of the large language models like a chatbot that's been trained on far less data for 500 dollars over the space of a week performs not that far off gpt4 Right, and I think that's I think that's a major thing that came up in that. If you're interested, find that memo online. It's absolutely full of zingers in terms of I think insights into what it's like to be on the inside of developing these models and how the how the ecosystem is looking. Um, so I think yeah, definitely worth looking into that. Um, and then the last one is actually just a silly thing. I, well, I say it's a silly thing; it could well be real. Um, I learned this week that someone's building an app where they're trying to train the model, a text to bark model, so that you can talk to your dog. Um, I know that sounds insane. The website looks like really professional, like it's not an April Fool's joke, which is what I first thought it must be something like that. Um, I've signed up, I have a little puppy, a little whippet, so I'll be attempting to hold um, deep conversations about large language models with my whippet. Um, Oh, they, they must be barking mad, aren't they? Fine. Oh, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to think they're barking up the wrong tree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly gives one pause for thought, <laughs> I would say. Oh, we could go all week, but we won't. We absolutely we should not. Just there is too turned much off news and here. Unsubscribed. <laughs> Sorry about that. No more puns for the rest of the, the rest of the session. We promise. Right, so that's your short snippets. Let's get into these big old chunky stories. stories. Martin, tell us about the Google I.O. conference. Google I.O., the annual conference where Google announces all things, uh, well, all things new for the next 12 months in Google land, really. And it covers everything from search to hardware uh, to Chrome, you name it, they are talking about it. And this year, the theme was uh, very squarely AI. In fact, I saw one AI word count that said they, in the keynote, they use the term AI 140 times throughout the keynote. So it featured front and center. Um, a few kind of headline pieces. One was that uh, Palm 2, 
their large language model, their foundational large language model, has been uh, basically baked in to the, or is going to be baked into all of the Google products coming soon. Uh, if you're using Bard, that had a major upgrade on the day of the event. So they took it from Palm to Palm 2. And in the coming weeks and months, we can expect Bard to become multimodal with image generation capabilities. Uh, they also upgraded the code abilities of, of Bard um, as well. So a couple of details about the Palm 2 model. It's a 540 billion parameter model. Um, it, uh, it uses a compute optimal scaling, which means it scales the model size and the training data set size in proportion to each other, which makes Palm 2 smaller but and more efficient than Palm 1. Um, it's also used in some of their state-of-the-art domain-specific large language models, such as MedPalm 2 and SecPalm 2. Um, and that just a few, they mentioned a few interesting things on MedPalm. So MedPalm is the the, the medical uh, LLM, the, the kind of domain specific uh, in, the, in the medical domain, should I say. And they said that MedPalm 2 is the first large language model to perform at an expert test taker level on the MedQA data set of the US medical licensing examination, reaching 85% plus accuracy. And it's the first ARA system to reach a passing score uh, on a couple of other exams. So the NED MCQA data set um, and the NEAT medical examination question scoring 72.3%. In fact, the BBC had an article uh, covering this story saying uh, meet MedPalm 2, the AI to replace your GP, which I thought was an interesting headline. Mm. Hyperbole! <laughs> 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 but it goes to show this, it's, you know, it's, it's cre creeping into that mainstream worldview that this is coming, this is this is potentially down the track. Uh, clearly, it's not going to replace the, the GP, but these tools are going to be used to, in diagnostics at some point soon we've spoke about it before but yeah the main takeaway here was that um, palm 2 is being baked into all of the products so you're going to see this being rolled out into search into google workspace gmail uh, and more there are a couple of other cool demos as well i don't know if you managed to catch any of this but the google maps fly through the city that was a very cool demo basically mm -hmm. they had uh when you do directions on Google Maps, and normally we get this top-down view with a blue line, well, now you will get a 3D rendered uh, like map view flying through the city streets with real-time weather updates or weather si weather um, simulations built into that model as well, all, all generated through. Um, AI imaging of the big cities. Now that's going to be rolled out across New York, LA, London, Tokyo, etc. All the big cities uh, in the coming months. That looked very cool. They've also got something about video translation with lip sync. So it, it dubs videos for international markets and it does the lip syncing in, in time with it as well. Uh, that one obviously causes people to prickle a little bit because of the potential for deep fake uh issues with that one but they did say that they're only releasing that technology to select partners so you can imagine that being rolled out to the likes of khan academy coursera you know those kinds of do you know the example i saw i saw this a, a while ago i don't know if it was google's technology a different one but i and i don't know what the movie was it was the one where two characters get stuck at the top of a very tall pole and it's and they're going to fall off and there's loads of drama over 90 minutes it was in the cinemas so it's probably a famous movie and i'm probably doing a terrible job of explaining it um but the example i saw they overdubbed it with a spanish voice and lip synced it and it looked and it's a you know it's a u.s film with u.s actors in it and it looked like it had originally been recorded in spanish same actors just their lips moving in perfect time 
to perfect Spanish. And I assume the Spanish was delivered by voice actors, but the, the lip syncing was done by AI and it looked incredible. Yeah, yeah. The, it, the example that they showed in the demo the other day was was very solid as well. So this is going to be an interesting one to, to see how... Um, I, I want to see who they give it to. Who is this technology being deployed to? Because they're clearly not going to make this available to everyone. They were very big on safety. That's one of the big messages that came through throughout the keynote is that Google is taking AI safety and responsibility very seriously. They want to reassure you that that is all in hand. Um, I would think art the artificially intelligent marketing podcast are probably pretty high on their list of priorities and getting the video version of this lip synced in another 40 languages and helping uh, us bring this to the world. I just, or, it's well, if anything, you say one. us, them helping us bring it to the world, if anything, we'd be helping them bring their model to the world. I think that's that's how they what a should watertight see it. argument. Absolutely. So uh, we'll get on the old emails and we'll get that yeah. over to them. So that Sundar, uh, please give us access. In fact, just give us that. Not please. Yeah. No, please. No, please. For your own good. Yeah. Um, that's quite enough nonsense. Um, there was there was a few other cool things around this, wasn't there? Like um, this generative AI everywhere concept. Tell us about that, Mike. So this is basically the palm to being deployed in every aspect of the Google interface. In the demo, they showed search, Gmail, um, they talked about, um, uh, so they had a Google Sheets example where you were in Google Sheets and uh, you could just ask it to, uh, if you were a dog walker, and you needed to manage your your dog walking clients, you could just say, create a table to help me manage my dog walking clients. And it would then, in Sheets, create a table with columns such as client name, dog's name, breed, frequency of walks, um, like cost per hour, all there just done for you in an instant because they had trained this on millions of uh, spreadsheets. So it just knows and it can do that. So that was pretty cool. Although I did see some responses of people on Reddit saying, oh no, now they're going, I think they actually the, the term that they used in the in the demo was, we're, we're gonna free you up from having to create all of these spreadsheets. And people will say, creating spreadsheets is the only thing about my job that I enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think also the, um... The download, the uh, the um, content marketing offers behind landing pages and forms of get your template, uh, that kind of puts the sword to those as well. Um, in terms of the example, I think I'd have full buy into that if there was an extra column that plugged in via API to the text to bark tool um, <laughs> so that I could explain <laughs> explain the itinerary to the dogs I was walking. That tool's called um, Sarama, by the way, S A R. AMA for those that want to go Google it. I promise you, it looks real. Um, but yes, it's cool to see that. And, and yeah, like we were saying right at the beginning of the podcast, Google going from being quite far behind and everybody waiting for Copilot to announcing all of this stuff. And um, I got, I've had um, Bard through my personal Gmail account for a while, but now I've been able to get Bard through my Biostrata google apps account and there was a, a how-to online um from google how to get early access to a number of these features so i'm actually expecting to start to see bard popping up to help me write emails and summarize text and rewrite text in documents fairly quickly whereas i haven't seen i know you've got one bit of information that maybe goes against this but i haven't seen a huge amount of movement on the microsoft side no. as it relates to copilot making it into people's hands google so labs is being they, they did announce this that google labs is where you need to head to uh to sign up for early access to these things they're going to have write it for me in gmail so where we've seen uh autocomplete on sentences in, in recent years it's now going to have a full write it for me and with a text expander and a tone changer and all of that kind of stuff baked in. Um, one thing about the generative AI everywhere, you know, if we look at the fundamental model of what, you know, what powers um, 
the Google enterprises is ads and search. And that was very revealing. They showed a, if in fact, if you go onto the Google website, you can see generative AI in search. And there is a GIF that shows generative AI implemented into Google shopping. And on the example, um, there is a, a search query, someone saying, uh, the, the search query is, uh, words to the effect of an ideal commuter bike for a five mile ride with hills. Now, typically that result would normally, of uh, it would have brought up some Google shopping results and then some blog posts with, you know, best bikes, best commuter bikes and, and all of that kind of thing. There might have been a featured snippet at the top of that that had an excerpt from one of these blogs. If you watch this GIF show the generative AI, what happens is you do the search and then the shopping results come up. So you get your ads, they're still getting the ad money in there. And then beneath that, a full screen takeover, like it pushes the organic completely off screen and comes up with a generative AI, like, you know, Bard style response, detailing different models of bike, bringing in images of the bikes, um, with some ads in the side unit as well mm -hmm. of the response. Organic's gone. Like yeah. there is, because then beneath that, it's encouraging you to ask follow on questions. Uh, it's giving you suggested questions to follow on. The organic results are, are quite literally pushed down the screen, like, bye, <laughs> you were yeah. ranking number one for this, and now you're not even visible. Yeah, I think it's, that could end up being fascinating. I, I, I was found it interesting where the Bard style response was also providing advice on how to make a decision for the type of bike based on different use cases and what's important to you and stuff like that. Um, I saw a mixed reaction to this. I saw some people online who were kind of excited because I think it still includes references, for example, where relevant and that type of thing. But yeah, in terms of just getting pushed below the fold quite far into an experience that the searcher can continue on in the chat style interface is, is obviously a bit scary uh, for SEOs and content marketers. I think the other factor there is we don't know how these models produce the outputs they produce, right? Nor does Google, presumably, or any of the other developers, hence the paper we talked about with GPT-4 trying to figure out how GPT-2 works. SEO has always been about reverse engineering what you think you needed to do to please the Google gods to get your content to rank first. How are you, how are you going to run those tests now? How are you going to figure out how to get your content, even if you can, get mentioned in those um in those bard style conversational responses yeah i mean it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out but you would think that that's just not going to happen and you have to hope people scroll down to the organics they gave one other insight into uh into the scale of google shopping actually they said there are 1.8 billion 1.8 billion updates to the google shopping inventory every hour yikes that is a and, and if you think about this is plugged in to this new <clears throat> if you think about this is plugged into the new llm um and the generative results yeah how are you gonna game that from organic it sounds like if they're showing ads above the chat response and within the chat response i think they're they're thinking well ha we found a way to not destroy our ad based business model we just found a way to squeeze ads into as many aspects of the conversational style barred response as we could um so if we want to get our brands and our links up into that conversational space we got to pay for it i'm yeah. guessing i i think that was certainly the message that I was getting from that. Ooh, SEOs everywhere wondering how is this going to change things? Um, yeah. So what's your key takeaway from this? Do you think? 
So my big takeaway was that this is all about UX. This is about making AI just accessible wherever you are. And whilst if you've been in this, you know, if you got excited about chat GPT from November onwards and went, oh, AI, this is exciting. Um, there was still a huge swathe of people that haven't seen it or played with it or given it much thought. This is about making AI accessible to absolutely everyone. Not everybody wants to or has uh, any kind of real need to be a prompt engineer. I was working the other day showing my wife how I was doing something with, with chat GPT and she just observed the way that I wrote a prompt and how detailed it was and how how crafted it was. And she was like, you've got to understand that that's, that you, you clearly think differently. when And when you've played with these things for a bit, you do. You, you can see a good prompter and that they understand how to put all of the context in that. People don't have time for that. The rest of the society, getting about you, your jobs and doing things, you don't want to be building these long, complicated crafted prompts you just want a thing in the google sheets now to do a thing for you you want whatever tool you're using you want it to be there to be easy to be seamless and i think that is where google have really pushed the the envelope here they if it lives up to the promise this is looking like a fairly seamless integration obviously the the there's a difference between the the shiny marketing pitch to the to the lived reality, but this is about just making generative AI everywhere, and it's a it's a UX play, and I can see that this could be a very strong one. I completely agree. I was asked this week when we can expect to see generative AI and other AI, I guess mostly generative AI tools in common use in workplaces. And for me, and, and this was before the Google I, I conference, I said, it's when it's baked into tools that people use every day already, and it's just there. I think I said that would drive adoption very quickly. And when you then have it, when Copilot gets properly launched and we've got it in Word and PowerPoint and Excel and see, and it will be interesting to see how fast we get this palm two driven tools they're not calling it bard are they i think they're calling it something else internally i can't remember what they're calling it but um when we see that in sheets and slides and docs and gmail that's what will drive i think we'll go very very quickly from you know on the old adoption curve we'll go very quickly from the early adopters which i think is people um many of which probably who listen to this podcast playing with mid journey and playing with writer and jasper and hyper right these other tools to get a feel for the landscape and see what they like i think you you go racing into the early majority once you put those tools in things that people use day in day out already which i think for most people is microsoft and google apps yeah absolutely and it will be the point when you don't even notice that you're using ai that's that'll be when you've got true takeoff agreed so i think the next couple of months on that front are going to be fascinating because I think I think that point's probably going to come I want to say faster than I thought. I was so excited about the co-pilot video and they made it sound like it was polished enough to like launch pretty much straight away and then we've not really seen much have we. Um, there are interesting developments with being in the edge sidebar which does give me hope that they are making a lot of progress but yes I think in the next couple of months co-pilot in Microsoft and Google's equivalent in slides and docs and all that stuff in Gmail is going to be going to be the accelerator for mass adoption i think um rightio that's a long story but it required it because there was so much there um to go through let's get through the others fairly quickly if we can um respect the lovely people's time who are listening to our podcast let's chat uh, anthropic expanding claude so for those that are not aware um anthropic is somewhat of a competitor i guess to open ai and other large language model developers uh, they have created a tool called Claude, which can be interactive in, in, in different ways, but in essence has a chatbot just like ChatGPT. And what's really interesting here is that they have upgraded the chatbot to allow it to process up to, I think it's 100,000 
tokens, which translate to about 75,000 words of context, which is three times more than OpenAI's max, which is also only in beta, that maximum context um, the, allowance. And only through the API. And only through the API, so you can't actually easily access it. This is a game changer for a lot of applications because it means that the AI can quickly digest and summarize reference and analyze large volumes of information. I think I read somewhere online, was it the Great Gatsby book that they uh, that they pushed into the tool, changed one sentence and asked it to find it, and it was able to figure out which sentence had been changed. So that was one example. I saw someone else had asked it to analyze an 85-page Netflix corporate, Netflix corporate filing, highlighting all the important stuff for investors and creating tables from balance sheets and providing analyses on marketing positioning and stuff like that, which I think is is really interesting. This is another big upgrade in terms of competing with OpenAI and, and honestly offering something better than OpenAI. Um, and I was reading in one of the newsletters that I subscribed to that at this point it's probably going to help perform several chat with your PDF and chat with your Word document tools that we'd um, previously mentioned on the podcast, just because of the sheer amount of information you can give it in one go. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you've been playing with this this week, haven't you, Martin, since it was released? What was your thoughts on it? Very impressed. And, and it is a game changer. It The ability to just throw huge volumes of text, ultimately, it's, a, it's about a novel. So a typical novel is about seventy to 100,000 words. So you can stick an entire novel in there and then just start having a chat with it. It's fantastic. A simple workflow that that we have on this podcast, I think we might have even mentioned it when we were talking about the Cohere summarization um, tool that they announced a, a few weeks back, um, taking a transcript from a podcast, a podcast that you know sometimes runs over an hour because some people just don't shut up. Uh, so taking a transcript for a full... A show like that there's a lot of words and if you try and put that into chat gpt you're not getting close like it's just you have to chop it up into so many small bits whereas what i did was gave claude an example of the way that we format our show notes from previous episodes i said this is how we format them i want to give you a transcript and then can you turn that into show notes and i did that for the last episode that we recorded chucked in the whole transcript and hit go and it produced show notes that were surprisingly similar to the actual show notes from last week's episode the headlines were actually identical which i, th I found really quite surprising um to have got that much accuracy but yeah absolutely totally usable and then i stuck in another transcript and it did it again and yeah it, it, that much context is uh it's in terms of if you're looking for a, a differentiator against something like GPT four, massive amounts of context will do it. Absolutely. I think that's probably where the next battle in the war of the generative AI companies may be fought is actually in contextual understanding and the ability to deal with large amounts of information. We um We've developed a process here at Biostrata for some of the podcasts and audio and, and webinars and things that we do where we where we generate the transcript, which is often a good 10, 15, 20,000 words for an hour. You'd be surprised how much um, nonsense we can talk on this podcast, especially. But, you know, when people are speaking quickly, any transcript is usually a lot of content. And we got to the point where we had to split it and chunk it. And you had to give ChatGPT, you know, maybe five six eight ten oh. sections you have to split that and that's kind of manual um and there's always the danger that ChatGPT forgets what one of the first sections was about and all this other stuff so the ability not only the speed and efficiency but probably the quality of the output to just be able to j dump that whole transcript in it really will i can't wait to get a hold of it I've, I've i've now put myself on the wait list i know you've had it for a while martin maybe you can have a word for me the um you know, ask Claude. Gets it. <laughs> Goodbye, friend Paul, please. Um, but yeah, if if you are if you're developing content at like webinars, podcasts, the ability to now turn that into text-based content like blog posts or eBooks has to be so much faster and easier now. I would have thought very much so. And just on the point about taking contextual content, 
we spoke the other other week about embeddings and fine tuning and you know putting huge amounts of data and then training your own model on top of uh any of the existing you know gpt fours or whatever and and these are complicated processes and for many smes in particular you don't you don't have huge 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 enterprise levels of of knowledge base and documentation but you do have maybe a novel's worth of of content and now you can just stick that in a prompt you don't need to create vector embeddings and databases and integrations just stick it all in a prompt and be like there you go there's our business handbook or our all of our blog posts from the past 12 months use that as context and and help me produce more could you imagine that give it give it sort of 100 odd blog posts might end up being slightly too many but um and then say which of these could be pulled together to make a summarized insightful ebook on that particular topic right give me infographic ideas based on the data that you find in these different blog posts yeah i mean you could do so much cool stuff right in the interest of time because i think we could go into so much detail on that one we will crack on Let's talk Stability AI and the text to animation tool it launched, Mine Stability AI has launched uh, Stable Animation SDK. So this is a tool designed for artists and developers to implement the most advanced stable diffusion models to create animations. And there's a number of ways that users can create animations. Uh, so they can do through prompts without images, so text-based prompts or they can add a source image and use that as the kind of seed input, or they can use a source video. Um, so you can also have text input plus an initial image input. So the user will provide the initial image that acts as a starting point for the animation and the text prompt is then used to, to basically guide the end result. And all of this has been made um, available for developers to integrate into their products, their platforms, what have you, via this new new SDK. So that's uh, just, again, making it really accessible, stable diffusion. So my understanding is that this uh, is actually, no, uh, is this open source? I'm not sure. I'm, is the underlying model open source? Um, I don't know if you can access it. One, so I, I had a, a dig dive a bit deep into this certainly you can't access it via a web app yet so it's not going to be easy for your average marketer if i take myself as an average marketer to get involved with playing with it as i understand it, at the moment you have to download the necessary files and install the sdk using python and you have to have a bit of coding experience to be able to use it at the moment i think ah uh, yes i'm just looking at the uh the model so it's all api driven uh pricing based on the size of the image so a dimension an image that's 512 pixels by 512 pixels the credit cost per operation uh, will be 0 0.058 cents um, and the credit cost per resample operation so 3d rendering mode which sounds pretty cool is a uh, 0 0.17 cents uh, yeah my take home on the pricing just looking at it was we've had a chat off air about how these models work to generate video versus text and it's certainly more complicated than what i'm about to say but in essence if a static image is a frame and an animation is operating at 20 24 30 frames a second in essence the, these tools are just creating many more images and stringing them together to create moving images i.e video and animation so it's probably going to eat up many more credits mm. and cost much more to create these short animations than it would when you are creating static images um the cost of those generations for the different tools you might use like dream studio or or whatever has been dropping all the time so i don't think it's be going to be prohibitively expensive for anyone if i'm honest but it probably will cost 25 times as much give or take one would imagine if you're creating a couple of seconds worth of video and it's you're doing it at 24 frames a second or whatever it may be the um, actual yeah. outputs themselves they look pretty you know at the moment pretty raw aren't they <laughs> yeah it's probably fair to say but a bit glitchy a bit glitchy a bit um yeah just a bit a little bit janky the transitions aren't super smooth at the moment much like we mentioned in last week's episode with the anime trailer and the 
the vehicle that's driving along the road and then suddenly becomes the road. Um, it's kind of got that slight vibe to it. But again, this is all day one. If you look at you know what we said about mid journey earlier on, just fast forward twelve months and where this is going to be, uh, yeah, and the the yeah. acceleration in this area is going to be huge. That's important to remember because we were like, oh, look at the hands. The hands look terrible, and they've got fifty-two fingers. And oh, look at the faces; they look like ghouls. And now, of course, we've got um, the Pope in a in his pimps, in uh, his Balenciaga coat, yeah, in his in his jacket, looking uh, looking like the boss. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think we can expect to see that improve quite quickly. I think for Marcus is using it now, um, providing they can get it set up. Um, the um, you could probably create some interesting glitchy style things if like if, to play with and get attention with online um but yeah we're not a production ready yet but as martin says probably won't be that long until we see the develops we need to actually get that quality so yes worth uh, digging that one and out and having a look um right next news is meta announces generative ai for advertisers so meta's unveiled a new product called ai sandbox which is aimed at streamlining the process of creating ad creatives for advertisers. Um, the sandbox provides three key functions. It can generate several versions of ad text. It can create a diverse range of creative assets for campaigns, and it includes a cropping tool for tailoring visuals for different sizes and formats, depending on where you're using it within the, the metasphere, if you like, um, of um, across um, Facebook and all these other tools. Um, what we are not able to fully explore it yet and tell you what it can do because it's not launched yet. It's not out. You can't actually access it. But it certainly sounds like an interesting development for marketers. Um, you could imagine a number of benefits that are going to come from this. I mean, off the top of our heads, you know, efficiency, because if you can use the AI sandbox, you can significantly streamline the ad creation process and come up with multiple ad copy variations, diverse campaign assets and stuff, and it'll probably do that all quite quickly or within the meta ads interface itself, right? You can imagine improvements in creativity if you've got a bit of writer's or creative block, a little bit like how people are already using Midjourney and, and ChatGPT to just give some ideas to get your own ideas going. So you might not use the outputs that the, the, the AI sandbox produces, but it might just get your thought process going. Um, I think... You can definitely imagine some real-time ad adaptation and performance improvements of your ads over time, right? Because if the AI-driven system is gathering data on what text and creative is working best for your brand or for different product types, different audiences, different messages, all that stuff, it could auto-adjust the creative and copy running ongoing experiments to improve results on an ongoing basis, right? Which I think there are tools, fairly sophisticated, expensive tools that are offering to do that across different platforms but this would be all within the meta ads interface itself which would bring it to many more people right yeah i i have thoughts on that so uh, when you read the, the the press release for this like the technology and the implementation again it's a kind of ui play isn't it we've got some cool tech and we've made it really easy uh, for advertisers to do background generation and some, the testing of different different creatives and what have you just reading some of the detail, they talk a bit about this Advantage Plus, which is uh, basically AI ML powered uh, optimization of your campaigns. I don't know if you ever speak to any Google AdWords specialists who talk about Performance Max. So Performance Max is Google's answer to, well, it's not answer, it's Google's product that says, Basically, let us deal with your campaigns. Give us budget and we will deploy ads across all of our ad units and they will be brilliant. Trust us, our machine learning algorithms know what they're doing. If you speak to any AdWord specialist who has been doing this in the industry for many years, they will tell you, do not turn on Performance Max. This is Google putting your ads in sub-optimized ad units um focus on tightly targeted keywords with high search intent all of that kind of stuff um be careful of turning on performance max because google will um will spend your your search intent money on keywords that you have no interest in bidding on 
Right. And my concern with something like this Advantage Plus, just reading the, the press release, makes me think, okay, this is Meta trying to sell ad units that you if you man if you go in and optimize your campaign, you you know what you're doing. I'm a reasonably confident advertiser on Meta, for instance. I'm not brilliant, but I kind of know my way around the system. I know mm-hmm. what ad units I will and won't buy, for instance. Um Advantage Plus will just start putting your ads anywhere that they want to sell an ad based on and, and they will use this AI creative editor to make the ads work in that ad space. And it makes it sound like, oh yeah, we're really doing you a favor. Whereas really what they're saying is, oh, we'll make your creative fit to that ad unit that you had no intention of ever buying um, so they can sell more inventory. Maybe I'm being cynical, Paul, but... Do you know, I think it's... A... We were going to try and make this one of our shorter episodes and it's not, unfortunately, because there's a lot of good discussion points to be had. Um, I am not a google ads expert but i know enough to be dangerous and and I, as you said that i do have those conversations i am extremely cool as many people uh, in the world and those listening to the podcast will know and a lot of my friends are google ads specialists and i've had this discussion a number of times um and i think my experience has been in the early days avoid switching on the automation google just wants to spend more of your money mm. But as the alg- my impression from a lot of the people I've spoken to is as the algorithms have got better, as long as you've manually run the program for enough time to give it the, the algorithm an opportunity to train on your particular ad set and your keywords that you're bidding on, so it can actually learn a bit about who the best people are to target, and then you uh, adjust it for things like cost for, per conversion based bidding, you can actually do better than micromanaging the cost per click bidding and using um, single keyword ad groups and all this other stuff that yep. Google Ads specialists used to do in the past. There is actually a book on this. It's very interesting by a guy called Patrick Gilbert called Join or Die, Digital Advertising in the Age of Autom- Automation, where he actually makes, he's a Google Ad expert, an argument for why now is the time to actually turn over the key, the the reins to the algorithms to optimize your campaigns for you. Super controversial. I can certainly imagine how your Google ad specialists wouldn't want that to be common knowledge or to be the common belief, because I guess in theory, it might mean that they feel or that their clients feel that they're no longer needed. I don't think that's true. I think it's exactly like when you're using um, ChatGPT, you need an expert monitoring things to make sure that nothing untoward happens. And when you're using Google ads, untoward means accidentally spending Hard thousands, of thousands or yeah. tens of thousands of pounds by accident on something that produces absolutely nothing. So expert in the loop is actually critical. Um, but yeah, my my impression had been that we'd starting to reach a tipping point in terms of people's attitudes on that. If you're listening to this and you're a Google ad specialist and you've got an opinion, hit us up on the Twitters um our twitter handle i never remember he is martin aim pod no god <laughs> <laughs> you know normally people who run podcasts would cut this but we're not going no move in. no because cool. we That's how we like it uh I, I i can tell you with certainty actually <laughs> it's never in doubt it's aim or ai marketing pod it's at ai marketing pod there we go there you go ai marketing pod um We'd love to hear what you've got to say. And if you want to come on as an interviewee on the podcast, we'd love to get you on. Message us on the Twitters, on the LinkedIn's. Um, we'd love to hear your opinion. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I think it, that's very interesting, mine, because for me, I we've heard a lot of this phrase, AI won't um, replace people, person X, but people who use AI will replace people, right? Um, but this is one of those examples where it could almost become quite quantifiable because you could imagine that if this works as intended our previous discussion completely accepted um the companies that are able to rapidly iterate automatically to improve their ad copy and ad creative to drive conversions and sales are going to very quickly pour more money into that system a they're going to outcompete the people who don't use the tools and then when everybody's using the tools and everybody's pouring money into the system, 
all the cost per clicks and all the other costs are going to go up um, and putting more pressure on the system. Meta's very happy that everybody's pouring money in and happy to spend more. But at some point, one assumes they're going to saturate the audiences through this and we're going to end up seeing so many ad variations and ads in our feeds that it could really pee us all off. So be very interesting to see what the second order consequences of this would be. Mm, yeah. Cool. Right. In the interest of speed, we'll rattle on. We've got a couple of extra things to chat through. Um, while we're talking about ads, let's talk about chatbot ads are coming. So uh, Microsoft this week has indicated that advertisements delivered by AI chatbots are on the horizon, potentially changing the landscape of search advertising. Um, this is not dissimilar to what we touched on briefly in terms of Mar what Martin told us in terms of Google search and ads showing up in the actual conversational area. I think this is what Microsoft is planning to do um, on its own platforms, but also interestingly with partners who have AI chatbots on their own websites, um, a little bit like Google Display Network or, you know, Display Network advertising, but for chatbots. Um, I would imagine that for most marketers, they're going to be wanting to use this to expand their reach once it sort of makes its way into different chatbots across the web. But it also got me thinking that as a publisher, I could imagine that if I had a big repository of content on my website, as a, you know, or, you know, what springs to mind for me is the natures and the sciences and the cells of the, of the life science world, which have all this incredible uh, peer review research articles that you could query and ask questions of via a chatbot. Um, but as a publisher, monetizing that by yeah. introducing ads, relevant ads in the chatbot experience would be, be quite relevant. And then at least in our market, I can imagine that being of interest to life science marketers, marketing instruments, reagents, tools that perhaps were used in those research papers to ensure that, that they're their products or their content is also shown in amongst that that chatbot interface. So this is quite early days on this. Um, if I've understood it rightly, there's no screen grabs or anything out there that shows you what this would look like, but it is a Microsoft press release. It is real. This is what they're planning to do. And as they say in a quote, we're ready to engage to discuss chat experiences, whether they need both algorithmic organic results and ads monetization or ads monetization only. We're listening to feedback from our partners as we continue to learn and evolve our offerings. So let's see how this plays out. Ads in chatbots and how different companies leverage that on their own chatbots and then how people bid and buy space in those chatbots. Yeah, got to find a good use case to have a chatbot on your website in the first place and then say time to monetize yeah yeah i think it's you've got to be a publisher with a with deep reams of insightful information or information and content that that chatbot can draw upon which is why i think it will end up being a publisher play but obviously if you if there are publishers niche publishers or you know broad spectrum publishers who reach your audience and they introduce these chatbots there's an arbitrage opportunity there if you get in early and you can negotiate those deals with those publishers and be the first that's shown in their chatbot experience. Because I can imagine that people are going to want to play with it and see how useful it is compared to trawling through archives of articles or just leading into Google search or whatever. So, so it could be interesting. We'll see how that one plays out. Radio, last bit is tool of the week. Um, I mentioned this at the beginning. I was able to get access to Adobe Firefly. Now you imagine, Martin, uh, 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 Imagine. you could imagine but hopefully you'll remember mine and i were super excited about this after watching the demo video which was really really impressive um, and i have now got access within adobe firefly there are a bunch of tools that you can um, get access to from being part of the beta you can get their text to image which is honestly not really very different from any of the other mid journeys and dollies and other things that are out there there is the recolor vector tool which I haven't played with much, but I can talk to, but is fairly novel and not offered by most of the other tools, certainly tools I've played with. And then there's their text effects where you give it a word and then it stylizes the text. And I think the things we were most excited in the demo video was um, things like having the Biostrata logo made, made out of dripping chocolate or um, fire and this type of stuff. So text to image, pretty powerful, makes some really interesting images. I think where it lacks finesse potentially or not finesse actually because the images look good it's more 
the scope of what you can do with it is it's trained on images owned by Adobe. So that's great if you're a large company and you're concerned there's going to be copyright issues down the line if you're using a stability AI or if you're using mid-journey. But I think it also does limit it. And I saw an example online, which I also ran myself, of trying to create images of popular characters or famous people. You just can't do it because Adobe's image set doesn't know who they are. So I tried to create an image of Deadpool. I saw this example online of how mid-journey will create an image of Deadpool sat on a car, but of course Deadpool being a Fox Disney character Marvel, yeah. at this point, Marvel Disney character, um, Adobe creates something that looks a bit like Deadpool, but it's clearly not, right? So I think that it's the text to image call, it has some real nice finesse to it, produces really high quality images, but there's stuff that it can't do that other open source tools can for good or real, right? On the text image, text to image front, this was the one I was the most excited about because it looks so cool the text effects yeah it's, yeah text effects sorry i've not described that correctly yeah you give it a word and you say make this word out of um dripping paint or balloons or something like that it is powerful it creates some really interesting effects but it runs into limitations extremely quickly and what i mean by that is in the example that i was using it for i gave it the word biostrata which is the name of our marketing agency and because we work in the life sciences, I said, buy a strata made out of um, cell culture cells. And it kind of gave me something that looked kind of biological, but there was no obvious cells. It looked a little bit like it had tried to make it out of a graphic artist representation of the organelles inside cells, like mitochondria and nuclear, nuclei and Golgi apparatus and that type of stuff. But none of them really looked accurate. So it looked like a designer who didn't understand science had created it, right? So I was like, well, I couldn't use that then for obvious reasons. So then I was like, oh, okay, well, let's try DNA. I pretty much got the same output as when I said cells. Oh. So it's almost like the back end is like grouping all of this into biology <laughs> and then doing what it thinks biology looks like. I tried chemistry and it looked a bit different. And in a few places, there were things that looked a little bit like conical flasks and stuff. There was still a little bit of like biology type structures in there that look a bit like neurons. I tried neurons, didn't really look like neurons. It just looked like biology. So very cool. You can get some really cool effects, but your ability to really explore a creative space, at least in the tool as it is, in my experience, is limited. I would imagine that if you keep it to kind of fairly, like the example that they gave was that they've done like food styling, didn't they? And like skyscraper, was it landscape, um, cityscape kind of images? Um, but yeah, where you start getting into quite technical things there, um, it, it's just falling flat. And clearly not many um, cell culture images in the old uh, stock library of Adobe. Well, and so herein lies the the rub because there are oh right um and it could have used I, I i think i tried at one point use microscopy images basically got the same thing again it's like in a in it's a in attempt to create this usable tool it's almost like the large language model that underpins understanding the prompt groups related terms to generate an output that looks a bit biological oh. but isn't actually the thing you ask for and that should, could be just because it's a demo really, because it's a beta, and maybe that will improve. Um, but I would say you can do some cool stuff with it. You can probably get some inspiration from it, but you can't just imagine to your heart's desire and get what you want. Um, and if we look at the Recolor Vectors tool, there's similar limitations there. So, for example, when you try and recolor the vectors, you can't give it a hex code and tell it what color you want, as far as I can tell. You, there are... 18 different color palettes, colors across the palette, white, black, a neon green, blue, but you can't give it your color. Yeah. So if I wanted to recolor a particular vector in Biostrata's brand colors, that option is not available right now. I have to recolor it in the colors that are made available here. So again, in implications of power with limitations that fundamentally probably wouldn't make it usable for a graphic designer 
delivering on a client brief, for example. Yeah. So cool power, wonderful demo. Probably if you're a professional designer, it's not going to be able to do what you need it to do just yet, is what I would say. In terms of actually using the tool if people wanted to sign up for it where, how do you interface with it is it through a web application is it a yeah. plugin in photoshop pass on the photoshop i haven't actually opened up photoshop to see if i can now access it through the fact that i'm on the beta i'm using the web app which is firefly.adobe.com you'll have to sign up for the uh, beta waiting list um, and then you access it all through a web app similar to the dream studio and um clip drop clip drop yeah yeah, and those types of tools cool so that was your tool of the week um thank you so much for joining us uh here please subscribe if you enjoyed this share it with your marketing friends if you found it useful maybe they will too martin love hanging out with your power thanks for your time today i'll catch you next week yeah see you next week head over to artificiallyintelligentmarketing.com sign up uh, to the newsletter you will get this email to you in your inbox as soon as the episode is released never miss an episode oh what a top tip nice one mine have a good weekend speak to you next week cheers See you later. bye thank you for listening to artificially intelligent marketing to stay on top of the latest trends tips and tools in the world of marketing ai be sure to subscribe we look forward to seeing you again next week